Oh, welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench we have a bit of an Tektronics oddware. This is a F TM500 plug-in. This is actually an FG507. I have not seen many of these out in the wild, and actually, in fact, this is the only one that I've seen out in the wild. So I grabbed it and I picked it up. This one's... haven't really gone through it yet. I've had it hooked up and had some signals out of it, but I haven't actually really gone through it yet. Um, gotten it fixed. I do know there is a fault on this one. So, unlike the other repairs, I know this one's broken, and I have looked at it a little bit, but I haven't really done much troubleshooting on it yet. This one comes courtesy of the U.S. Navy. So, this one was uh, decommissioned, I guess. Uh, I got it in a used equipment lot, so the thing that was interesting about this one that I that I liked is this is my FG501A and if you'll notice this section of the plug-in it's identical it's exactly the same exactly the same plug-in actually functions I think exactly the same um, same layout same everything main difference between these two this is a sweeping uh, function generator while this is just a static function generator so I picked that one up for the sweeping capabilities. I don't have a sweeping function generator in the lab yet. Um, you'll see why I don't have a fun sweeping function generator once we get this hooked up to a scope. So let me get my test frame in and I will uh, show you guys what it's doing and then we'll figure out what we got to do to fix it. Okay, here's the output of the function generator. Um, one of the goofy things that I do know about this particular function generator is most function generators start with a sine wave and then convert that to triangle and square wave. This one actually starts with a triangle wave and then shapes it into a square wave and a sine wave. So that's, uh, I found that to be pretty interesting. So this one, I can vary the frequency. I can make it square waves. Except the oscillator just died, so that's interesting. Well, that gives us a clue as to what might be wrong with it. Let me see if I can get the signal back real quick before we dive in too deep. Okay, it definitely looks like I may have a switch problem. So let me work on cleaning the switches on these real quick and see if we can't make it a little bit better. The one problem, if I can get it to misbehave, although the oscillator just completely falling out wasn't expected, there's the square waves back. So as I'm changing functions, I'm getting everything back. So there's, a nice, there's an okay square wave. There's the triangle wave like it, should be, like it should be. And now the sine wave's actually behaving. There was a uh, cut into the sine wave so that was the main problem with it so I may just have a crusty switch on this one but time will tell okay we've actually caught it caught it misbehaving a little bit so the unit's on everything's there I'm in the middle of recapping the power supply because some of the electrolytics didn't look so hot so I was actually just testing it as part of the recap and it came up it's been coming up fine the last couple of capacitors that are replaced, but the last one that I did, which was the last one in the supply, um, it acted stupid again. So this is the triangle wave. You can tell it's not stable at all. A ton of jitter. If I switched over to sine wave, this is supposed to be a sine wave, but we've got this funky thing down here that's going on. So um, the square wave's not stable either. And just by switching it back and forth, I've gotten it to stabilize. So there's, obviously there's an intermittent fault in this one. So we're going to see what we can do about it. Because I want this unit nice and stable. No problems, but there's a sine wave back. So you guys have now seen what I'm, what I'm fighting with. So this is what the challenge of the day is. Let's see if we can make it better. Okay, here's an update on the... FG507, uh, this thing has been a monster. Uh, there have been a ton of issues with this. 
So I uh, will give you guys a rundown of where we're at, and then I'll show you the last bit of issue that I'm fighting, and we will go from there. So what I was fighting was, in hindsight, with this coming from the Navy, I should have suspected it. This was near salt water. So the switches were incredibly corroded. So I was getting intermittent contacts on the switches, uh, which was causing the oscillator to come on and come off and fall in and fall out. And it was acting funny like you, like you guys saw. The Let me warm up the other scope here real quick. Um, got that fixed. Then there was a board problem. Everything was going fine. It ran fine for th two days. No problems. Didn't fall out. Didn't do anything. Got cold outside. Started a fire down in the lab. We have a wood-burning stove over in the corner. Made it real warm down here. And uh, the oscillator could work. I was doing some final testing. Was thinking I was going to continue on with the video. Get this thing fixed. And fell apart. So the waveform fell apart, moved it up to my powered bay with the fan, and as the room cooled off, the oscillator came back. So I'm like, okay, well, this seems to be thermal related. As, it, as the room cooled off, it got better and better and better until it finally was working again. So I found out for that, wiggling the board right here would cause the oscillator to go off and on. So somewhere in here, there was a dry solder joint. I found a couple of them that were dry, some of them that were cracked. So on this entire section of the board, I went through and I retouched up every single solder joint and everything, but I was still having problems. So um, in this case, the alcohol didn't touch the corrosion on the switches. So deoxid actually took care of it wonderfully. The switches look gold again. They were black. I didn't even realize they were supposed to be gold. So, since I got this apart, it can go in backwards. If you're ever working on these and you have the two locator pins out on the bottom, you can insert the plug-in upside down. It will seat. Don't do that. Electrically, you'll burn it up. Um, so, it's when these pins are out. That's uh, the locator pin. You can put it in upside down. I also, while I was in there, replaced some of these capacitors. These had gotten hot. Where's the worst one? There's the worst one. The jacket had shrunk off the caps, so those had gotten warm, so I stiffened up the power supplies, and that's all working now. So where we are at right now, today... So as you guys can see, we have a nice triangle waveform. It's set to triangle on the function generator. If I flip it over to sine, the sine wave actually looks pretty good. Um, I've been checking the harmonic distortion on the sine wave. And as I touched up the solder joints on the back of the board, I got a little bit of harmonic distortion back. Um, it was running 0.7. Uh, with everything I've done to the unit so far, the new caps, the, the new caps brought it down to 0 0.5. The retouching up all the solder on the back of the board brought it down to 0 0.3. So the THD is actually looking pretty good. Still not quite in spec, but not expecting this to be a low THD, especially for its age. And the fact that the sine wave is derived from a triangle wave. So THD spec's not too important to me. But, so, we have it on 10 to the 3, so this should be 6 kilohertz, 6 kilohertz sine wave. Let me just check it on the frequency counter. Yeah, 6 kilohertz, it's a little high, but it, and it's moving around a little bit, not, not much. So, right at about 6 kilohertz, which is what we have it set to. So, we'll turn it up. We get what we'd expect on the scope. Faster waveform, we're at 60 kilohertz. Turn it up again. We're at 600 kilohertz, so I have to adjust the time base. Here's the interesting part, and here's what I'm fighting right now. So we'll bring the time base back down. Move this down to... There's 60 kilohertz. 6 kilohertz, 
there's 60 kilohertz, so line frequency. We'll go down to 6, this should be 6 hertz. Well, what happened there? So, the waveform shrank, and it got a whole lot faster. I can speed this up, and the scope's not even fast enough. Well, that's not triggered. I got a trigger on it. This scope's fast enough to pick this up. So, we have a sine wave, but it's not what we're expecting. This should be 6 hertz. We are on a time-based speed of 20 nanoseconds. Um, measured on the frequency counter, this is actually a 10 megahertz sine wave. So when I set it to 1x, it's the oscillator screaming at 10 megahertz. So now it'll do... Well, technically that's supposed to be a triangle wave. And that's supposed to be a square wave. So we're way pushing it past what it should be doing. And we're actually overclocking the chips. So let me get the schematic out and I will show you guys what is going on. Because I think I'm finally getting this one nailed down. Okay, so what is going on with this thing? Well, the short answer is... Switch 9, which switches in this capacitor. So at 10-0, which is where we start having a problem, is when this cap first gets switched in. So I thought this cap might be a problem, so I checked it on the uh, LCR meter, and this cap actually checked out very good, which is really, which is really good because these caps right here, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. It's a matched set to keep the frequency right. So if any one of these is gone, that would be problems. These are the timing caps for the individual ranges. So that wasn't my problem. But the other thing that gets switched in is this op amp matrix down in the bottom. So on 10-0 is the first time this switch closes. And it's the first time this switch closes. So there is something wrong in here. We have two op amps, and we have a bunch of resistors, and we have a capacitor right here. So the resistors probably aren't suspect. There's no burning or anything like that. So I don't think the resistors are going to be the problem. I am suspecting one of these two op amps may be damaged. And this cap may also have a problem as well. But uh, one of these two op amps is definitely screaming at 10 megahertz. And that's why our oscillator screwed up. If you switch in any of the other resistors, um, the sine wave actually collapses. It just, it just goes flat and it actually stops oscillating. So that is what we've got going on at the moment. So I was able... These are... LF356s, it's an old TI part that's obsolete, was able to cross-reference these to a current op amp. So I'm going to order a couple of op amps. Um, the only thing that's really special about these op amps is they're 3 megahertz op amps, so they're even screaming faster than they should be. Uh, the only thing that's special about these is they run up to 36 volts, so they're a pretty high voltage op amp. So, uh, well, I'll get some more ICs ordered and get them replaced. The other thing I noticed is, yep, that's off. My two offending ICs are right in here. This is that big timing cap that I thought may have been a problem. It ended up testing okay. But when I was poking around in here after this had been on for a little bit, these two op amps were really warm. So they're definitely drawing some current. But uh, I have a sneaking suspicion one or both of these has gotten damaged at some point and maybe gave up. And that is why this comes to find its way to my bench. So let me get some parts ordered. Through the magic of the, I will have to wait through the magic of the camera. You guys will not. I'll bring you guys back if there's anything else interesting. This thing has been a pain in my butt, but it's got enough time on it now. It will work. Um... 
also given its rarity, I want it, I do want it to work. So we will see what we can make happen. Okay, so we're back in a lab. It's been a couple of days. Um, I've been working on this thing, doing some final testing on it. As you guys can see, it's all reassembled. Everything's put back together. Plates are on. It's nice and warm down here. We have the fire going. Seeing if this thing's going to give me any problems or mess up. Here's the schematic we looked at last time. I checked every single part in this timing network, and everything checked good. The op amps worked okay. The Everything was good, so... What I ended up doing was I very aggressively cleaned the switch again. I've also replaced the sockets. And I do want to talk about those a little bit. Because this is a sore spot you may want to run into. So after the socket was replaced, the, switch was, um, the switches were aggressively cleaned again. And it looks like my low ranges are back. So you'll remember the slow ranges were the ones that were giving us a hard time. And as you can see, they're going even slower. It's still a sine wave. It's just running slow. I mean, our time base is 20 milliseconds of division. So this is one of the reasons why digital scopes at least for incredibly slow signals, are better than analog scopes just because of the persistence of the display. So what I'm going to do is let me move the digital scope down here so I can get the unit and the scope and the camera, and I will show you guys the slowest range this thing has. This function generator will go down to 200 nanohertz which is an incredibly long time. It's got a 200, or it's got a millihertz range on it, and then it has a divide by 10. So it can get uh, real slow. So I'll bring the scope down and we'll take a look at that. But what I'll do is I'll get the uh, sockets that I put in and I'll show you these TI sockets because these things are problematic. Apologize for not having a macro lens. This is about as close as I can get. Um, Looking at these sockets, you can definitely tell the difference. This one's got a lot more metal in it than this one. You can hardly... It'll cooperate. You can hardly see the metal in the pins. What happened was, when these were being made, uh, there was some patent arguments. Uh, this is actually a Texas Instrument IC socket. They didn't want to pay royalties. I forget which company... who. Uh, to who, so they wanted to make their own socket, and instead of what they did where with this socket, it grabs the IC pins on the outside of the pins, the flat part, they, these sockets grabbed the pins on the narrow part of the IC pins. So if I get another socket here, instead of grabbing the pins on the flats, it grabbed the pins on the edges, which is far less. There's far less to grab on and a whole lot more um, intermittent connections. What I'll do, since these are junk anyway, let me pull one of these pins out. So here's one of the sets of pins. I don't know if the camera will focus on that. There we go. That's one of the pins that's in that's one of the pins that's in the IC socket. So there's the flat part that solders into the board. And then this, that just went into Never Never Land. Grab another one. So here's the pin, here's the socket. These would grab the socket or the IC pins in that direction, which does not make a good connection and is actually pretty terrible. So they're intermittent. If you see these, they are uh, 
well worth replacing, especially if they're giving you trouble. It was some of my trouble. The other trouble was a bad range switch, which I will show you. Put this in the bowl of shame for the bad parts. Okay, I've got the Rigol booting up and We have the function generator set to two. Sweep is off. We'll give it a sine wave. Actually, we'll give it a triangle wave. It'll probably be easier to see. As you guys can see, it is oscillating. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this down to its lowest range. This is it two hertz. This is 100 milliseconds per division, 12 divisions on the display. So I'm going to turn this down to its lowest range, and I'm going to wind the time base up, and I'm going to set it for single shot capture. And so now it's going to run, so the time base is at 50 seconds per division. So this scope is going incredibly slowly. This is set at two times 10 to the minus 3, so this should be running right about 2 millihertz, so very, very slow. Sweep is actually set to off, uh, shouldn't even be sweeping here in a second. This will flip over to wait. That's when the scope's triggered, and then it'll start acquiring a signal. I'm going to let this sit because this it is running. It doesn't look like it's doing anything, but it, it actually is running. Um, I'm going to let this sit. I'm going to turn the mic off and just let the camera record. We will speed this up in post, so you guys do not have to wait on it. But I will give you a real time as to how long it took to draw the waveform uh, in, in post. 50 seconds per division is as slow as the scope goes. It doesn't go any slower. So 50 seconds per division on an analog scope, you wouldn't be able to see anything. The, the dot would be on the screen forever. So I'm going to just let this run, and I'll come back when it's finished. Okay, we're on the bench. I've got uh, the calibration document, the adjustment procedure. Everything's all warmed up. Turns out we are actually going to need to use quite a bit of uh, the equipment that's here on the bench. I didn't realize it, but this is a, this the calibration for this guy actually uses extensive use of the AA501. What I'll do is I'll print out the adjustment pots. Um, and then I'll get focused on the piece of equipment that I'm monitoring the adjustment with, so you can see, so you guys can see what I'm adjusting, and then the effect of it. And uh, since I'm not doing a scope, it's not going to do any good if you guys just stare at the front of the display for a little bit, because it's going to be a pretty boring video with me just telling you guys what I'm doing. So let me get uh, let me get a couple things printed out. Here's the adjustment procedure. I'll get my adjustment locations printed out, and then uh, we'll go through an alignment on the function generator. Okay, here's some of the adjustments. This is the main board, so it's got a lot of a, a lot of adjustments on it that we'll need to work on. Depending on what uh, function generator you have, this will be on the back side or the front side because this is a dual slot plug-in. It's on the front side. This is going to be hard to adjust. I'll have to actually have to take the bottom of the uh, frame off, but we'll get to that when we get to it. This is the shaper board on the side. And then this is the 
sweet board. So this side of the unit, actually, this is the sweep board. You guys can see it on the camera. So the sweep board with a couple of adjustments on there. So with that being said, let's get into it and get started. Okay, so here's the preliminary configuration of the unit. Go ahead and pause the video now. Um, some of the key points are 20 and 20, square wave, centered, centered, all the way down, centered, uh, free run, zero dB, 10 milliseconds, triggered sweep in, and it didn't say anything about manual sweep where it should be, so that is the preliminary setup. So the first things first is doing the power rails which is going to be adjusting the plus 15 volt to start. So I'll turn this sideways and we'll get that hooked up. Okay, so test point 1323. R1301 is right up there above the is right here, which is incredibly hard to see. Our 1301 is, is right up here above this pot, but it needs to be 15 volts, 14,985 to 15.015. We are at 15.00, so don't need to touch that. That one's good. We'll move on to the next rail. Okay, we're down on test point 14.51, and the adjustment is 13 R1341. So the adjustment pot is right here, this guy right there. That one is a little out. We will need to adjust that. All right, I'm gonna adjust 1341 for negative 15 volts. I think that's pretty good. So we have the probe hooked up at, t at test point 113. We're checking the 15 volt supply accuracy. The meter reading needs to be between 4.975 and 5.025. We're looking for before 4.975, so we are good. But since we're so early in the process, let me readjust the negative and the, f and the positive rails and we'll see if we can't get that a little bit closer. These rails are interactive so if you adjust the positive 15 you have to adjust the negative 15. Go back to our other test point. We are within spec plus 4.975, so that's good. Next one up is the 20 volt rail. We're on test point 1321, and there's no adjustment for that, it's just checking it. We are at 20 volts, good enough. We're checking the negative 20 volt rail now which is test point 1241, which is down here. And 19.90 uh, to 20.1, 19.99, we are good. 1642 is actually on the sweep board on the other side of the uh, unit. So I'll get that turned around here in a second. And the accuracy is adjusted on the sweep board. So let me pull this off. I'm being very careful as this is open and from here backwards is exposed mains. Oh, you guys can't see that. From here backwards is exposed mains. So I'm being real careful turning this around. So this is the 
high side of 1642. Our tolerance is 1498 to 1501. So we are well within spec. I would have had to move the plug in over because 1640 is the adjustment pot down here and it's blocked by this rail. It's about right here, so I wouldn't need to move it over if that needed adjustment. That is good. We are in good shape. Okay, I need to go to the negative side of 1640. That's down here, so let me move the plug in real fast. Okay, we're back with the plug in pushed over. Reading voltages on the negative side of 1640. Uh, we need to be within 300 millivolts. We are. So that is good. And that concludes the power section. Next up is the dial alignment. Okay, so this is going to be interesting. We have to line up this knob, this coupler, and this pot with this display. <laughs> so, um, let me get an Allen wrench. All right, so we loosen the, loosen the coupler. So if I, you can see as I turn the coupler over here, sorry about the focus, the display is moving. So what I need to do is I need to turn this. Just until it stops, which is right there. Now what I need to do is hold, hold the coupler steady, and I need to get right square with this to align that. And then we tighten this down snug. Now we move this to 18. That's 20. No, it is still off. So let's try that again. Right there. Okay. All right, let me get back to this. Let me do this one real quick, and then I'll be right back. I need to be square on. Okay, what I was fighting in the last one was given this soft aluminum rail, um, the, uh, this had made a divot. So every time I tightened this down, it rotated the shaft, even though I was holding both pieces. The set screw would fall into the divot, and it would uh, cant back, and it would de-align the dial indicator in the front. 
the way I got around it was I, I held, I used these needle nose pliers and I held the shaft of the pot and tightened this screw down and did the adjustment that way. So this shaft was, is still done, but this was, a, this is a lot harder steel. This is aluminum. So this allowed me to get everything lined up. So we're right on 20. My reference is the center of the scope. Back this off to 18. And then wind it back to 20. And it should stop moving no, not outside of a half a division. And it stops right at 20. So that alignment's perfect. I'll have to do that again with the stop function. But uh, that's at least the front dial alignment. Let me see what's next. <laughs> okay. I went through this a whole bunch of times. Got everything all tightened back up. I need to redo this one just a little bit. So what it is, you set this to 18. You set it... You watch the scope, make sure it stops moving. Right when the frequency stops moving, you want to make sure you're within one half of a division on the dial, not the scope. So it's the dial indicator that's the problem. So I gotta, I'm gonna redo this one here a little bit and uh, get that one going. I got the, I got the start frequency perfect. I gotta do the stop frequency. So let me get that done. And bring you guys back. Okay, well, half a division is about as good as I'm going to get, so that, but it, that is in spec, so we are good. Okay, we're adjusting the offset, which is this pot right up here, 2201. So what it wants is I have the plug-in centered for ground. We'll hit that, and what we want to do is just center that on the display. Yep. Ground reference. There we go. All right, offset is centered, so there we go. That's step nine. Now what we want to do is sine wave. We want to adjust 1104 right here, 1104 on the aux board for a centered sine wave as well. That looks good. Okay, so we're moving all over the lab for this. Um, I'm going to focus you guys in on the AA501. Um, this is one of my more obscure pieces of test gear that I have. To adjust the sine wave distortion, we have to play with three adjustments, 1412, 1511, and 1421. The adjustments I'm going to be focusing on are here, here, and here. So it's this guy, that guy, and this guy down here. 1412, 15, so this is 1412. This is 1511, and this is 1421. And what I'm adjusting for is the lowest number on the distortion meter. So let me move you guys up there, and then I'll get to adjusting. Okay, I have you guys focused into my distortion meter. So let's see how low we can get this. So it looks like 1198. That was 1511. I'm moving to 1412. Ooh, there we go. Okay, let me try the 
Let's see what 1421 does. Whoa! Well, we're going up. This one's touchy. The other ones have some adjustment range in them. This one's really touchy. Okay, so it looks like one... 79's my low spot. Let me go back to 1411 and see if I can squeeze anything else out of here. Ooh, there's some more. A little bit. Check this other one up here. This is, I'm back on 1511. Looks like 0.178% total harmonic distortion is gonna be where we're at. Yeah, so that's where we're gonna be at. Okay, so I need to now adjust the C multi adjust, which is 1591. I need to take the bottom off of the power frame to do that, so let me get that done and I will be right back. Okay, for the multi C adjustment, um, I got it the best I could. You hook the meter leads up to the op amps that are hiding back in there. I'll show you guys what that looks like here in a second. And you're looking for 0, 0.0000 volts on the digital multimeter. And uh, I got it the best I could. I even twisted the meter leads together. I'm in a really noisy environment, and we're, in, and we're into the reading of the hundreds of microvolts. So... It's down around three, but my environment's just too noisy. I can't, um, I don't have a, a Faraday cage to put this in to do this measurement. So I got Wi-Fi going everywhere. My sump pump's firing in the background. There's just a lot, I got computers and switching power supplies everywhere. There's just a lot of electrical noise here. So got it the best I could, but uh, that's all I'm going to be able to do with that one. So I'm on to step 12. Just so you can see where the meter leads were hooked up. They were hooked into pin two of these two op amps, those ICs right there. So those were the ICs that were giving me problems, and those are the sockets that we uh, replaced earlier in the video. So that's where those were hiding. Okay, we're doing the uh, bottom end SimCal. So we're adjusting 1441 for the lowest reading on the distortion analyzer. Okay, there's my lowest reading. There we go. Okay, I had a problem in the, last, in the last step that I was working on, so I went back a step and I realized that um, I had made a mistake on the front panel. 
uh, there was something hiding in the text. You need to have the multiplier set to one, and then you get a good reading. We now have our zeros, so we are good to proceed. Okay, we're back doing the step 12. That's the bottom right there. Okay, so we're gonna adjust R1210, which is right here. Um, I have the scope set up already per the instructions. I'll move you guys over. Okay, the scope is set up. We're having to use the 7A13, um, which is the differential comparator, 10 volts. Everything's all set up. We're looking for that peak, I believe. Let's see what happens when we change it. All right, so it goes off the screen. And we want to bring it down. That's about as close as we're going to get it to right there. So this wants it to be at the center graticule. Check ground here real quick. Okay, so that looks like it is good enough. I did check that the VC is, is actually accurate on the plug-in. It is. Uh, the VC is set to 10. It's saying 0 0.9999. So good enough for 10 on the voltmeter. So we at least know VC, the comparators. At least in the ballpark. Let's see what's next. Okay, working on the sweep calibration. 1546 is down here on the main board, so that's the adjustment we're doing. I don't have a Tektronics frequency counter. I do have a GPS disciplined oscillator, or a, yeah, there's a GPS disciplined oscillator acting as an external reference for that for stability reasons that never gets turned off. So uh, my measurement's going to be a little bit different than the uh, manual because it because this is has enough digits it's reading exactly what it is so instead of 10 it needs to be 100 so this is off by 1.6 so we will adjust that now get a longer cable here real quick this one's a bit short 1546 is all the way on the bottom of the sweet main board so I actually need to move the plug in to the other side because I have to get at that control uh, well, it wants exactly 10.00, so we have got an additional zero, so that's going to be good for that one. Just so you guys can see what I moved over, this is the adjustment right here that we just did. It would have been too close to this rail, so I kicked it over to the other one. This is a three-bay module that I've just taken apart, uh, taking the top cover off. All right, I'm adjusting the start frequency, which is... R1205, and we're adjusting this for 20. Oh, close. There we go. I can't ask for better than that. Now it wants 10 to 5. All the way up. And I may actually have to turn off the 1K filter. Now we need to adjust C1714. Okay, we're on the main board side of things, not the sweet board side of things. C1714. Let me zoom out a little bit. Here's the main unit. C1714 is right here, buried in all these transistors. And we want to adjust this for two and as many zeros as we can get. Wrong way. Ooh. Ooh. 
very fiddly. I did not move that much at all. I need two and three zeros per the spec sheet. That is two and three zeros point six. I'm gonna leave it there. That is an incredibly fiddly adjustment, so that's gonna be good there. Okay, the stop frequency adjustment is done based on a DC voltage, but it's on U1310, which is right here. Uh, it's one of the only 14 pin dips on the sweep board. Everything else is eight. Low is pin seven, highest pin eight, or low is pin 14, highest pin eight. So both sides, one side of the IC, and you need to adjust R1200 to plus minus one millivolt. So, all right, and we're here at the multimeter. Here's our IC. That's R1200, that's the one we need to adjust. Yep, this is going to be fiddly. That's gonna be it right there. It's just about to speed the meter up. We need, let me speed the meter up just a little bit, see if we can't get that a little bit better because it climbed. There we go. It climbed up again. The adjustment is so light on this control, I am not even moving it. And the voltage is bouncing. There we go. Gotcha. Okay. Um, this video is also already getting pretty long, so I got to do the log peak adjustment 18 and 19. Um, it's the same thing that I just did, just on different test points. So I will go ahead and get that done real fast, and then I will bring you guys right back when we go to the XY offset. Okay. I have the digital multimeter hooked up. Everything's ready to go. We're going to do the log peak adjustment. Um, which is R1700, which is right here. And there's our end result. So we needed 
plus minus one here. We're well under that, so everything's good with the log peak. So I need to adjust log peak two, move the multimeter, and we'll work on the second part. Exact same adjustment, except now we're adjusting 1503, which is right here. Okay, given the start and stopping, I got the step 19 done. 1503, it's the same thing as step 18. But part of my confusion there was the general setup of the frequency counter. Because I had it confused, so I redid step 18 and 19. It's 20, 20, square wave, free run, 0 dB, all the way up, center, 10, 3, variable is clockwise, centered, free running, sweep, 20, 10 milliseconds duration, and this one doesn't matter. The lab cat is vocal. But that's the setup for step 18 and 19. Um, the way you get there is preliminary controls, and then on 415, in the start-stop frequencies, 15, 16, they tell you to do 20 and 20 and a few other things. So that's how you get to the combination of controls. But this is the way. This is the way that the display needs to be set up for those two adjust, or the front panel needs to be set up for those two adjustments. Okay, the uh, step 20 has been driving me nuts a little bit, and I've figured out why. There's an error in the manual. Um, so if you look at the preliminary controls, it wants a vertical plug-in of one, one volt per division uh, with AC, DC, and ground set to AC. But then it wants you to adjust the offset of the plug-in to center the control. Well, you can't do that if the scope's in AC. The scope has to be in DC to actually get the offset measurement. So what you're doing here is you're setting up the function generator for centered, no offset, 5 volts of division square wave at 1 volt per division. So you can then hook up a scope probe and feed that signal back into an IC on the sweep board, and then you can make an adjustment. I've got it every I've got everything set up on the scope, but what I need to do is I need to get my scope probe, hook it up, and then I'll show you guys actually how this adjustment's working. This is uh this is specifically step 20, the the Y offset 1820. So got that running, everything's good to go. Let me get uh the scope probe set up and then I'll bring you guys back. Okay, I think I finally have this figured out. So for the offset, for the Y offset which is what we're doing. You actually need the second function generator, which I have a second video that's gonna go up about fixing the other, about fixing and calibrating the second function generator. The scope probe, the 10X probe, has to be hooked up to the second function generator, not the front panel of the, of the unit. DMM pin four, ground. You adjust the frequency dial for zero volts. There we go. Okay, I finally figured out what I was missing on step 20. Because this just, this didn't make sense. So what you do is you don't feed function generator into the IC. What you end up doing is, and it didn't make sense feeding the function generator into an output, because pin six on an op amp is, on that particular op amp is an output, so that didn't make sense at all. So, function generator, function generator sets up scope for measurement. You get everything centered on the scope, everything like that, you go down to the lowest bandwidth, you see we have some lines. The one thing it doesn't tell you is to pop the sweep hold out, so you have to get it sweeping. If you put the sweep hold in, it's a DC line. Doesn't do any good. So you have to pull the sweep hold out. Once you pull the sweep hold out, if you tweak this, you can see how the 
um, displays changing, what they want you to do is set it for a the lowest peak to peak. But if you go too far, it'll fall underneath. So it's the lowest peak to peak value you can get. These bursts of static that you're seeing on the display a little bit, that's from ambient noise. I, uh, I haven't tracked down exactly what that is yet, but it's some pretty wide, wide band signals that, are, that sometimes drive me nuts. But that makes a lot more sense now. So here are the connections, probe tip to ground, DMM, DMM. You adjust the start frequency to the to a zero DMM reading, and then you can make that adjustment with a plug-in. I actually had to find a plug-in because the plug-in I was using didn't have a bandwidth limit on it, and you need a 20 megahertz bandwidth limit for that one. So that is step 20, uh, R1820. So we are moving on. Oh, when I had when I was connecting everything, I had the unit off. Getting the probe tip in there is pretty tight with the IC in the socket. So turn everything off, let it discharge. That way, uh, if you do end up bumping something, it doesn't blow the IC up. Okay, this one looks kind of complicated, but it makes a lot more sense when uh, after going through the first one. So scope probe stays. We're on pin 9 of that now for ground. Sweep duration is manual. The function, the other function generator is into the pot on top, so it's setting it. And what we've done, pot gets adjusted to zero, or the manual duration adjusts the voltage to zero. You pull these off to clean up the signal. And then on the scope, our offset's off quite a bit actually. We adjust 1726. right there minimal minimal deviation after that we remove all test leads and reattach the potentiometer all right i need to adjust 16 1622 for 200 hertz on the frequency counter 1622 is right there so that's the one we're going to be adjusting. I will move you guys up to the frequency counter and make the adjustment. Well, on my particular unit, this is a multi-turn bot, so that'll be nice. That explains why it's a multi-turn bot. This doesn't... this is not taking much. There's 200. We've pushed the manual trigger button. And so now I need to adjust the scale factor, which is R1620, which is right next to 1622. But I need to adjust this for 2. So we're pretty close. Well, I'm not going to argue with that. Okay, now we're doing the anti-log adjustment, which is 1804. 1804 is right here at the top of the sweep board. So what I need to do is I need to push the log sweep. 
and I need to adjust this for two. Turn on the low pass filter so we get some of that noise out of there. Make the counter settle down a little bit. Well, I'm not going to argue with that. Okay, so we're going to do the gain match. So I need to move the start frequency to 20. And then I need to adjust 1702 for 2. 1702 is right here on the sweep board. This pot's a little dirty. So move back and forth just a little bit. Uh, uh, that's gonna be as good as I'm gonna get, and that's, okay, so this is gain matching, so I need to bounce this back and forth. So I'm gonna be going back and forth and back and forth for a little bit, so I'm gonna pause the camera here. Uh, when I get done, I'll bring you guys back. Okay, so we're adjusting our 1700 now. I got that done, that took about 20 times or so back and forth to get that right, and the adjustment narrowed up each time, so. I'm glad I didn't bore you guys with it. So we're adjusting R1700 right here. And I need to adjust R1700 for two. And that concludes those adjustments. So now we're into offset adjustments. So let me get all set back up for that. And then uh, I'll bring you guys back. Okay, I am getting set up for offsets. So we set this to DC and this to VC. Too far off. There are the peaks. All right, so there we line up with radical center, and we're at 0.55. Uh, we set this to negative, and I need to adjust R 2201. until these match up down at the bottom. So there's that one. Now I need to do the same thing for the sine wave offset. So plus sine wave minus we need to adjust uh, 
our 1104, 1104, which is on the aux board right here. There we go. And my comparison was really close, so I just adjusted the compensation. But we can go back and do it. We'll just switch it over to plus. Oh, wait. Got to kill center. So here's that. All right, let me move this over so we get a good scale. So halfway between present position and graticule center, we're going to call it right there. And then we're going to adjust Call it right there, and then we'll just adjust this the rest of the way. Like so. There we go. Okay, doing the square uh, sine wave amplitude, so we just hit sine, and now I need to bring that down. I need to adjust 1106. There we go. Cool. Just above, so point 0.1 for the square wave. Now we have to flip it back to triangle. Positive. We have to adjust that so it's positive. There we go. Now we push the square wave button again. Same direction and same amount. So we will need to adjust this just a little bit because we're the same amount, but we're low. So I need to adjust 1728, which is right here, to right there. There we go. Now we need to take a look at the uh, square wave compensation. Do that the same way we did on the other one on the Rigel. So I'll get that set up and bring you guys right back.
Okay, the square wave compensation looks good. So I am gonna leave that there. Let me stretch this out. So that actually looks okay on the top. Back this off, just one. Response looks okay, nothing's too high, too low. But uh, everything looks good, so we're gonna call this done. Thanks for stopping by the lab and taking a look at these two, well, one function generator in this video. This Fixing this function generator actually caused two videos. Um, everything that's in the parts of shame bowl actually came out of both of those two plugins. I had to get him, I had to get the uh, non-sweeping one fixed so I could get the sweeping one fixed. But one of the best parts, I finally put the cow sticker back. So I'll have two videos. I ended up not doing part one and part two. Um, this video is a lot shorter than this one. It's going to be a long one, so but thanks for stopping by. Let me know how we're doing. And I will see everybody in the comment section and in the next video. Bye for now.